Greetings, Avalonians. I hope you and your families are doing well at home as we're uh, dealing with these odd days. Uh, but I thought it would be a good idea for me to try to send a short um, kind of review quickly of the this last section of Chapter 6, the Persian Wars, which we didn't have a chance to talk about in class. I, um, it's my hope that the videos that I sent, especially the 11-minute video, uh, were, were helpful in this regard. And I don't want to cover too much of the same ground, but I think just trying to pull it together would be a good idea. So let's go ahead and get started on that. I mean, you see, once again, I mean, if you've been working with your study sheet, as I trust you have, you, you'll remember that you know you see a lot more here at the end um, in terms of detail than we saw earlier. The earlier sections it's as topics more than anything, and towards the end, a lot more of that is being filled out. But here, um, it's, it's important to keep in mind. What the contemporary of these wars that is our main source for it is Herodotus himself, who is the first great historian. In fact, he invents the term history and uh, and, and really sets the West, um, before any other culture, into the habit of writing the kind of histories that we would recognize. Before this, history was really just a list of great deeds um, done under particular reigns of kings. That There wasn't a, a kind of story sense to what history um, is. So his presence in this is, is worth remembering, and we'll learn more about Herodotus in the next chapter of our, of our text. Um, the, the thing about the Persian Wars to keep in mind is that it, it sparked at the time of Cyrus the Great, who had created the Persian Empire. He had gone from being a vassal under um, a, a Median king to the king, the, the marrying into the royal family and turning the Median Empire into a Persian Empire and conquering Mesopotamia as well as, as former Hittite territories that were now a Lydian kingdom. But as he conquered Lydia, that coastal area of Asia Minor, as you recall, is on the southwest coast of Asia Minor, is Ionia. And Greeks of Ionia, uh, descendants of Mycenaean refugees, like any other Greeks, were pretty fiercely independent. And they didn't want to take this kind of conquest lying down. And so they did what all Greeks do, and that is call for other Greeks to help them. And, and the main ones that responded to that call were other Mycenaean descendants, the Athenians. And so the Athenians came to the help of Miletus. This is one of the main cities in Ionia and helped them in their revolt and even helped burn the regional capital Sardis before that revolt got crushed. Now, this is, you know, a little par for the course in terms of warfare for that area. But keep in mind, the Persian empire is, it's, so I sometimes call it the first amoeba empire. Because they're going around and doing something larger scale than any previous empire had done, it's absorbing, you know, the you know all the great old power centers like eventually Egypt, you know, Mesopotamia, the old Hittite lands, and so they don't want to they they really can't afford to tolerate any kind of revolt in in some section of empire like this because it would suggest that other people could get away with doing the same thing. And so the great first great successor of Cyrus, this is not his son. I think one of the videos um, called Darius, the, uh, the son of Cyrus, he's, he is a relative of Cyrus, but there was a son in between who briefly ruled and, and died early <clears throat> and then sort of a chaotic period. But Darius is the first great ruler after Cyrus of the Persians. And he it, it has every intention of punishing the action of, of the Athenians in particular, but the Greeks in general and taking over all the rest of Greece, just like they conquered all the rest of these other major sections of the ancient world. And so, <clears throat> he, you know, keep in mind also, um, the Persians are based in an area where their natural navy is in the Persian Gulf. Uh, this is why we still call it that today. It's to, the Persian territories are today Iran. And so he had to create a new navy in the Mediterranean using ships and sailors from Egypt and from uh, the, the Phoenician territories and, and other, at this point, Persian lands around the eastern edge of the Mediterranean, uh, as well as amassing a huge army and crossing the Hellespont and conquering an area called Thrace. Today, that's part of northern Greece, but at the time it was a, a technically separate territory. And it, it trying to establish this, this un- uh, unresistible force to conquer all the Greeks and punish Athens. 
and seeing this come down upon them, the Athenians took the unusual decision of deciding to essentially abandon their own city. Uh, well, not abandon. They left, they left the women and children in the city and with instructions that if they failed to, to, to kill themselves before being dishonored by the Persians. But they went out north to meet the Persians at the ground of their own choosing at a place called Marathon. Now, of course, that's the origin of, of why we the people today run marathons. But uh, at Marathon, um, helped by the fact that Darius's navy, at least a big portion of it, had been had been shipwrecked in the north by a, by storms that ran them aground. At, um, at Marathon, they were mainly dealing with with the with the armed the the army forces, the land forces of the Persians, and at least at first, it delayed the remainder of the late of the navy in, in, in getting to that spot. And what the Greeks did was use a trick. Uh, this is, the Greeks are pretty well known for using tricks by thinning out the central section of their forces, um, which made them naturally sort of cave in upon themselves as they were attacked by the Persians, and then surrounding the Persians and taking away their mili their their numerical advantage and forcing them in upon each each other as you know as they're just kind of tightening a noose around the Persian forces and suffering surprisingly few casualties. They, they, this, you know, the, the numbers are something like, you know, under 200 Greeks die and thousands of Persians die. Um, and in this process, you know, the Greeks had, of course, sent out calls for aid. And, and in any war, the Greeks would go first to Sparta. But Sparta was celebrating a, celeb a, a, a religious festival where they and said, no, we can't send any help. So here you have a really unusual victory at the end of this, this is the end of the first Persian war. And the, the great military victory goes to Athens instead of Sparta um, in, in that first war. Now, in between, I should mention, and it's, it's mentioned down here, in between the two Persian wars, the Athenians discover a silver mine nearby. And Amazingly, their democracy decided, rather than splitting up the cash among citizens, to use it to pay for a navy. And they're quite aware that they, they'd gotten off um, amazingly well at Marathon, and there was no reason to believe that the Persians wouldn't try more to come back at them. Um, Darius wasn't able to, to mount a second attack, but his son Xerxes took that up and recreated an even bigger navy and amassed an even bigger army. And, you know, had every intention of completely annihilating the Greeks. And when he came through, he, uh, you know, he, he, the Greeks by this time, and all of Greeks, all, all of Greece, you know, were contributing forces to a, a league of defense and had tried to meet the Persians up in the northern sections of Greece. But, you know, after a few losses, it, it were retreating south and decided to try to, <coughs> excuse me, to try to, to capture or, or take a get, use the natural terrain to take away the Persian advantage by forcing them into a mountain pass called Thermopylae, which means gates of fire. It's a, a narrow section and that once again, if you force the large army to go through a narrow spot, then you can fight just the front ranks of their army and you're not going to be overwhelmed by their huge advantage of, of numbers. And so um, it seemed like it, it was a good tactic until the Greeks were betrayed by a Greek who told the Persians how to get around that pass um, using kind of a narrow track. And so uh, like a shepherd's track around the mountain. And be, because the, the Greeks got wind that the Persians had learned about this, um, the Spartan king, Leonidas, mentioned here, sent most of his forces away, kept only 300, and sent principally the allies away, including the Athenians, and, and stayed at the mountain pass of Thermopylae with those 300 to hold off the Persians for as long as possible and to, to die defending that mountain pass, having bought at least a little bit of time for the rest of the Greeks, um, which gave Athens a chance to regroup and once again, they took an unusual decision. They took 
all the women and children this time and evacuated them to the island of Salamis. They put all the men on the ships, this, this navy that Athens had, had built. And, and so in, in time to you know, escape the, at this point, inevitable destruction of their city, the Persians swept in and burned everything in Athens and, you know, in punishment for, for their part in all of these different defeats. And um, what the Athenians were able to do with their navy was to lure the, the larger Persian navy with larger ships into the narrow straits of Salamis. And every single citizen, you know, as as a you know, manning the ships and all the, as I said, all the women and children defended on or at least evacuated to the island. And in these narrow straits, the smaller Greek ships won. The Greeks knew that stretch of water better, and they knew the the, the nature of the winds, and you know, and they were able to maneuver around and to ram and to set fire to lots of the Persian navy, and really rout them. Um, they didn't destroy the whole navy at this point. That mop up at, later on would would happen at a place called Mikale or Mikael. It is a not very nice sounding pronunciation, but you'll sometimes hear that. And the uh, but but the defeat at Salamis is really the the definitive moment. Um, at the Battle of Salamis, Xerxes himself was sitting on a nearby mountain watching the proceedings and astounded that his invincible navy was being it was being tricked and outmaneuvered and, and defeated uh, so, so so soundly. And after the Battle of Salamis, Xerxes himself went back home. He left land forces in, in Greece with you know in charge of defeating you know the rest of the Greeks. But the Spartans came through and 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 and, and routed those those land forces as well as liberating the city of Athens. By the way, and the, and and there were you know. Uh, the, once again, aside from that Spartan help here at the end and the very famous battle of of Thermopylae, it's really Athens, both at the Battle of Marathon and the Battle of Salamis, who are responsible for not only attracting the the you know uh, vicious attention of the Persians, but defeating them. And this is something you know. It, you know I mean, at, at the Battle of Salamis, in fact, uh, you know, there is, or before the Battle of Salamis, in, in this Greek league where all the different city-states are, are represented, you know, there were city-states saying, oh, well, Athens doesn't deserve to be here. They don't have a polis anymore. Their city's been burned. Um, and the Athenian reply was, well, okay, but we'll take our navy with us and you'll, you won't be able to defend yourself. Um, you know, Athens had really astounded the world themselves the Persians, um, by defeating the, the Persians, which nobody else was managing to do, not just once, but twice. And it's this kind of massive confidence in themselves, and ironically, the opportunity, in fact, to rebuild their own city, that led to the explosion of the Greek classical culture that came to follow, that the world has revered so much ever since. Um, and even after these these Persian Wars, it was still you know it was still unclear that the Persians wouldn't be coming back for another round, and so and since the Athenian navy had been so decisive in, def in defending themselves and everyone else in Greece, they were able to convince everyone except the Peloponnesian League members to join a new league that they called the Delian League, and this was the, the treasury was centered in Delos, an island associated it was supposed to be the island where Apollo was born. And, and, you know, it, it was supposed to be a league of, of all Greeks contributing to, towards the common defense, but Athens ends up using it to create an empire. And so the, this is sort of the seeds of, its, of the Athenian destruction, because it's naturally going to attract negative attention from Sparta. All right. Well, guys, that's a little longer than I hoped it would be, but hopefully helpful to you guys. And... Good luck studying, and I hope to see great grades from all of you on the test coming in a few days. Take care. See you guys later.